Hello and welcome to Wineskins, a program featuring reflections on the lives of the saints and the sacred scriptures, along with a variety of topics and issues from a Catholic perspective. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda. Our show is sponsored by the Annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. On our show today, I will interview George Garchar from Catholic Charities. We will also hear more about the life of St. Philip Neri and the readings for this Feast of the Ascension of the Lord. That and more on Wineskins. Now, on this World Day of Social Communications, Brother Dominic Calabro will share some thoughts with us from the Holy Father. Human beings are storytellers. From our childhood, we hunger for stories just as we hunger for food. Stories influence our lives, whether in the form of fairy tales, novels, films, songs, news, even if we do not always realize it. Often, we decide what is right or wrong based on characters in the stories we have made our own. Stories leave their mark on us. They shape our convictions and our behavior. They can help us understand and communicate who we are. The truth is that all stories are not all good stories. Some stories deal with exploitation. They lull us into platforms of gossip, violence, and falsehoods that become consuming. By consuming those patchy, hateful messages, bad stories can ultimately strip humanity of its dignity and work. We need stories that reveal who we truly are, also in the untold heroism of everyday life. The Bible is a story of stories. How many events, peoples, and individuals it sets before us. It shows us from the very beginning a God who is both creator and narrator. Indeed, God speaks his word and things come into existence. The Bible is thus the great love story between God and humanity. At its center stands Jesus, whose own story brings to fulfillment both God's love for us and our love for God. The title of this year's World Communication Day message is drawn from the book of Exodus a story in which God intervenes in the history of his people. The God of life communicates with us through the story of life. Jesus spoke of God not with abstract concepts, but with parables, brief stories taken from everyday life. The story becomes part of the life of those who listen to it, and it changes them. The Gospels are also stories, and not by chance. They ultimately conform us to Jesus himself. The gospel asks the reader to share in the same faith in order to share in the same life. The history of Christ is really our story and always timely. It shows us that God was so deeply concerned for humankind, for our flesh and our history, to the point that he became flesh and history. These stories cry out to be shared, recounted, and brought to life in every age, in every language, in every medium. Our own story becomes part of every great story. As we read the scriptures, stories of the saints, and also those texts that have shed light on the human heart and its beauty, the Holy Spirit is free to write in our hearts, reviving our memory of what we are in God's eyes. When we remember the love that created and saved us, when we make love a daily part of our daily stories, when we weave the tapestry of our days with mercy, we are turning another page. We no longer remain tied to regrets or burdens or sadness, but rather we open ourselves to others. With the gaze of the great storyteller, the only one who has the ultimate point of view, we can then approach the other characters, our brothers and sisters, who are with us as actors in today's story. For no one is an extra on the world stage, and everyone's story is open to possible change. Even when we tell of evil, we can learn to leave room for redemption. In the midst of evil, we can also recognize the working of goodness and give it space. So it is not a matter of simply telling stories as such, or of advertising ourselves, but rather remembering who and what we are in God's eyes, bearing witness to what the Holy Spirit writes in our hearts, and revealing to everyone of his or her own story, which contains marvelous things. In order to do this, let us entrust ourselves to a woman who knit together in her womb the humanity of God and, the Gospel tells us, wove together the events of her life. For the Virgin Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. 
Let us ask for help from her, who knew how to untie the knots of life with a gentle strength of love. Let us pray. O Mary, woman and mother, you wove the divine word in your womb. You recounted by your life the magnificent works of God. Listen to our stories. Hold them in your heart and make your own the stories that all want to hear. Teach us to recognize the good thread that runs through history. Look at the tangled knots in our life that paralyze our memory. By your gentle hands, every knot can be untied. Woman of spirit, mother of trust, inspire us too. Help us to build stories of peace, stories that point to the future, and show us the way to live them together. Amen. For Wineskins, I'm Brother Dominic Calabro. The Feast of St. Philip Neri is celebrated on Tuesday. To tell us more about this holy priest is Joan Lawson. She is a religious education consultant for the Diocese of Youngstown and a member of St. Patrick Church in Youngstown. Born in Florence, Italy in 1515 to a family of modest income, Philip frequented the Dominican Church of St. Mark. Later, he became acquainted with Benedictine spirituality. He was ordained to the priesthood in 1551 at the age of 36. Through his apostolate in the confessional and his spiritual conferences, he attracted a group of followers who ultimately formed the Congregation of the Oratory. In 1575, St. Philip received papal approval for the Congregation of the Oratory, and the Pope gave him the Church of St. Mary Vallicella for its headquarters. In 1578, Philip began construction of a new church, and to this day the Romans call it the Chiesa Nuova. In the last years of his life, between the ages of 75 and 80, St. Philip concentrated on the ministry of the confessional and spiritual conferences. He died in Rome with a reputation for cheerful goodness and optimism. The three prayers of the Mass describe very well the spiritual traits of St. Philip Neri, who deliberately cultivated some eccentricities in order not to fall victim to the admiration of the people. He also declined all ecclesiastical honors. In the opening prayer, we ask God who raises up your faithful to the glory of holiness to kindle in us the fire of the Holy Spirit who so filled the heart of St. Philip Neri. His insistence on chastity based on humility and lived in joy was prompted by the ardor with which his heart was inflamed by the Holy Spirit. The motto of his congregation is sola caritas, love alone. The prayer after communion invites us to imitate St. Philip Neri by hungering after this sacrament in which we find true life. The discovery of authentic values can provide a truly fascinating vision of holiness whereby one can experience the Christian joy of living. Few can resist the unbounded confidence and optimism of St. Philip Neri. The Office of Readings contains an excerpt from a treatise by St. Augustine because there is nothing available from the pen of St. Philip Neri. He burned all his writings before he died. St. Augustine refers to the joy of being in Christ, and this helps us understand better a saying of St. Philip Neri, a servant of God ought always be happy. The spirituality of St. Philip Neri is relevant and available to all. It is beautifully summarized in the words of St. Augustine, wherever you are on earth, however long you remain on earth, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Consequently, the duties and involvements in the affairs of this life need ever be an obstacle to the love and service of God. For Wineskins, I'm Joan Lawson. Joining me again is George Garchar, who is the Executive Director of Catholic Charities for both Portage and Stark Counties. Welcome back to Wineskins. Thank you, Father Corey. I'm happy to be here. One of the words that oftentimes we use in the church when we do the work that we do, whether it's in Catholic Charities or diocesan institutions or parishes, is ministry. Why do we need to keep that focus that what we do in the name of the Lord is ministry? Why is that important? I think we need to continually remind ourselves that we are providing these 
services in the name of the church and in the name of Jesus. And I'm not trying to say that other organizations in the community that provide services are not doing a good job. They certainly are. But our call really is to be the hands of Christ in the community. And so that term ministry is important. Our leader, Stephen Caratini, when he came to us a a little over a year ago, made that a priority. You know, we were using the word programs and sometimes you still have to, it slips out or or if you're dealing with a secular funder, sometimes you have to be a little careful in in terms of the the language. But for the most part, we've been trying to remind ourselves to use that word ministry. And I think that it's indicative of the way that we try to provide service. That call to the dignity of the human person, respect for life, all of the values that the church espouses, I think, are contained within that term. That whole sense of ministry also means that we do it together. It's a collaborative effort. It's a partnership. Obviously, in the work of Catholic Charities, besides the funding that we get from the diocese, there's additional funding that come from other sources. But there's also personnel and and assistance and programs that are done in cooperation with other groups. Who are some of those groups in, especially in Portage and Stark County, that you work with? And why is collaboration and partnership so valuable? Uh, Let me take the latter question first. I mean, there are lots of reasons that that it's important. Obviously, we want to be good stewards of our resources. Mm -hmm. And we try, therefore, not to you know, duplicate or reinvent the wheel, so to speak. We recognize that there are individuals and organizations that are very good at certain aspects of service. And so we try to take advantage of that and refer people mm-hmm. that need that help to those agencies. So just from a practical standpoint of making sure people get the right service and making sure that we're being good stewards of resources. The other, I guess, very practical reason is that it is a growing demand from funders. That, you know, funders want to see collaboration. They want to see cooperation. We don't want to see people competing for unnecessarily and having a negative impact on service as a result. Let's talk about some of those people specifically that Catholic Charities helps. Let's try to put a face to some of those people. Granted, there are some people that come maybe every day that really don't need the assistance, Mm -hmm. but there are those who come because they're forced to, as you had mentioned, maybe they're out of work or they have a medical issue. Let's put a face to that and why is it so difficult sometimes for people to come and ask for help? In terms of the difficulty, I mean, there are very, especially individuals or families that have recently encountered a bump in the road and that need our help for the first time. They're often, you know, they're not used to that. And so it's something that they have to swallow their pride a bit, Mm -hmm. recognize that this is a time that they need help. Other times, very often, they were the ones providing the help. And they often Mm -hmm. say that, you know, I've donated to Catholic Charities and now I feel badly that I have to come and use these services. You know, there's that aspect. I might just add, I guess, in terms of the variety of folks that we serve, it really ranges from those that are very low income, homeless, near homeless, up through, you know, again, those families that have up till now been self-sustaining, but have either through job loss or very often a medical condition have had a situation arise where they need help now. One of the programs, or I should say one of the ministries, see, I tripped myself up that Mm -hmm. time, that we are very proud of that's for a specific population is our first step Mm -hmm. program, family support, where we help starting with pregnant women, families with toddlers up to the age of three, where we provide Mm -hmm both material support in the way of, you know, diapers, formula, clothing, but also emotional support and you might say some light parenting tips, a little bit of case management. We try to meet people where they are. We don't have formal parenting classes, but as we're providing the material assistance, our case workers get to know the folks, get to know what their needs are develop a relationship, and very often these folks see us as a trusted resource. Let's very briefly mention again how important the bishop's appeal is, because that money does go directly to fund these ministries. What would you tell the folks that are with us about why it's important for them to contribute to the bishop's appeal? First and foremost, I guess it is really part of their responsibility as a Catholic, at least to give to some charitable purpose. I'm not saying it necessarily absolutely has to be Catholic Charities, although that seems like the most obvious choice, certainly to me. I'm speaking with some vested interest, mm-hmm. of course, but it is a an institutional available way for them to meet that responsibility. Mm-hmm. So I'd say it's a responsibility, just as much as it is to go to Mass on Sunday, to be charitable. And then I would like to think that people, if they knew the ministries that we provide, mm-hmm. they would 
would see the need for those. They would see Christ in the people that we serve and know that we are doing our very best to serve in the name of the church. Well, George Garchar, thank you so much for your ministry and your service to Catholic Charities, especially in Portage and Stark Counties. We know that the need is getting greater oftentimes, and sometimes the resources are getting smaller and slimmer. And so we encourage the folks that are with us to keep those in mind, especially when we talk about reaching out in Jesus' name through Catholic Charity Services. So thank you for what you do. Thank you. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jim Corda. To receive more information and to listen to Wineskins, visit the website of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown at www.doi.org. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. I am Marino. Je suis Marino. I am Marino. I believe that we are all connected to each other, and that is the gift of compassion that unites us and makes us one. It doesn't matter what language, culture, or tradition we come from. We can share compassion wherever we are. Mary Knoll, an American Catholic organization of priests and brothers, has been reaching out to those in need for nearly 100 years in 26 countries throughout the world. Mary Knoll dedicates 86 cents of every dollar donated to their programs, and with your help, they can do more. Missionaries, workers, volunteers, supporters, we are all Mary Knoll. I am Mary Knoll. Yo soy Mary Knoll. I'm Father Mike, and I am Mary Knoll. 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 33 million Americans have descended into poverty. And as their futures fall, so does our nations. Christopher Minutes, thoughts on making every day count. Here's Monsignor Jim Lasanti. Michael Applebaum and Corinne Rambeau fell in love as seniors attending Lexington High School in Massachusetts. But the young woman was a French exchange student and went home at the end of the year. After finishing their education, Michael pursued a career as a concert violinist and Corinne became an attorney. When Corinne returned to the United States almost a decade later, she called her old friend. This time, everything was right. A year later, Michael Applebaum moved to Paris. The couple is now married and the parents of two sons. It had to happen this way, says Corinne. She believes their time apart gave them the necessary maturity to make their marriage work. My friends, not all goodbyes are forever. Once in a while, life gives us a second chance that may be even better than the first. I'm Monsignor Jim Losanti. Make this a great day. Our song today is by the Kellenberg Memorial High School Choir. It is from their CD entitled, Mary, A Light in the Darkness. Stop it. 
Our scripture reflections for this Feast of the Ascension of the Lord will be by Father Jim McCarns. He is Pastor Emeritus of St. Paul Church in North Canton. Summertime is the season of homecomings. The old tradition is that people come back to the towns where they lived before. Our parish festivals are types of homecomings. And we begin the season with the most spectacular homecoming of all, Jesus returning to heaven. This is Ascension Day. He went home after 33 years on earth where he preached a new way of life. He went home after demonstrating the excellence of love as it had been never witnessed before. He went home after astonishing the world with his miracles, his capacity to suffer, his acceptance of death, fulfilling his promise to rise from the grave. When he went home, the angels must have lined the halls of heaven and shouted his praise. What a homecoming it must have been. We also shout his praises and rejoice in his return to heaven. We have the second glorious mystery of the rosary, the Ascension. Sunday, we always say the creed, He rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. There are many paintings, stained glass windows, poems, music, and other forms of expression to commemorate the ascension. There's the little verse, Rise, glorious conqueror, rise into thy native skies, assume thy right, where many a fold the clouds are backward rolled, pass through those gates of gold to reign in light. One thing Jesus took with him when he ascended into heaven was a body covered with scars from the whiplashes, from the nails, from the thorns, and the lance to his heart. We also carry scars from our days and nights of Christian living in the world. These are marks of identification showing we are followers of Jesus. St. Luke says the apostles watched Jesus ascend into heaven. As they were there watching, the gospel says two men appeared. They were dressed in white. And they asked the apostles, Why are you looking at the sky? But their answer was not recorded. And I imagine they answered that question something like this. He is our friend. We are sad to see our friend Jesus leave. But he told us just before he ascended, I am with you always until the end of the world. Thanks to Jesus. We never walk alone. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jim McCards. Why did Jesus leave us in the Ascension? Because he wanted to strengthen us. He wanted to be with us in a special way in his Holy Spirit. His Ascension doesn't mark Jesus' absence, but his real presence among us always. Wineskins is made possible by the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. The program is produced by CTNY, the Catholic Telecommunications Network of Youngstown. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda, wishing you a blessed Sunday and a safe holiday week. have you done for your marriage today? I gave my wife a hug this morning. I thought uh, I love her. I uh, did her hair this morning. I think it looks pretty good. <laughs> I cooked my husband's uh, favorite breakfast. I bought her an orchid. What have I done for my marriage today? I sent my husband a love email. I read the newspaper to my wife and it cracked her up. She's, but she's still laughing. <laughs> what have you done for your marriage today? 
Make a change for the better. Need help? Go to foryourmarriage.org. A message from the Catholic Church. They say America is the land of opportunity, but for some, life isn't so easy. Right now in America, one in six children lives below the poverty line. That's nearly 13 million children of all races all across our country. Where do you draw the line and get involved? You can make a difference in more ways than you think. Go to povertyusa.org today because one in six children in poverty is one too many. A message from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development.